Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to a special episode of Pit Lane Parlay. My name is host Mike Jokum. I am joined by our buddy George Butts. We are here to talk Rolex 24 coming up in about eight days, nine days from recording. So, you know, coming up next weekend, we are here to preview all of the cars, the IndyCar tie-ins, and some other uh, predictions. This week, this episode is brought to you by our new pals at Corsa Brew Coffee, uh, CorsaBrew.com. Everybody's going to need plenty of coffee for the Rolex 24, including Jess and I, who will be down there in person. So if you go to their website again, it's CorsaBrew.com and enter promo code PLP2020. You can get 10% off your order. So, George, where should we start? Hey, guys, and uh, thanks for having me on. I guess the best way to, to start this out would just be giving a general overview of who all is actually in the race this year. Quite an extensive list of actual drivers, but... Well, we might as well go over the entrants themselves rather than go item by item. Yeah, great uh, great call there. So I will start with DPI, the Daytona Prototype International Cars. There are eight of them this year, two Acuras, you have both Penske's, the two Mazdas, and then we have four Cadillacs. So our IndyCar connections there will be, well, this is a lengthy list, Sebastian Bourdais, Simon Pagano, Juan Pablo Montoya, Elio Castroneves, Alex Rossi, Ryan Briscoe, Scott Dixon, Mike Conway, Mr. Ryan Hunter Ray, Tristan Vautier, uh, Mateus Laced, and Juan Pedrahita. So lots of guys in the DPI class with IndyCar tie ins. So, George, give us a little DPI preview. Well, it's uh, looking like a pretty stout field this year. Uh, we've lost a couple cars since last year, unfortunately. Let's see. We obviously lost the Nissan DPI that was run by Core, which is a, a bummer because that was a gorgeous looking car. Uh, last year for IMSO's 50th anniversary, they did this sweet throwback livery. Then we also kind of had a merger between Mustang Sampling and JDC Miller. So instead of three entries between those two entities, now we just have two. But it's a stout field, like I said. All three of the manufacturers topped the time charts during the roar test. Cadillac's got the most bullets in the gun, if you want to use that uh, that metaphor. And they've won the past three Daytona 24 hours. So some could say they're the favorites, but all eight entries were within a single second during quote-unquote qualifying during Roar, uh, with Mazda setting the quickest lap and broke the track record, and pretty handedly. Yeah, it's pretty impressive and uh, you know, a great Roar weekend. I'm, I'm definitely curious to see if the Penske guys can show a little bit more pace. I know last year was tough because you know that rain was just insane but i thought they would be a little better last year than they were so we'll jump down to lmp2 uh, so there is one multimatic riley uh, that was the car that james davison was supposed to be in unfortunately due to circumstances beyond what we know he is not in the car next weekend and then there are five oreca 07s so Let's see here. IndyCar connections. Ben Hanley with Dragon Speed. Adrian Newey's son, who's in Super Formula. And we're going to throw this in there, even though he's not technically an IndyCar driver. He's been rumored. I don't know what, George, the past two off seasons now, and Colin Braun. So the LMP2 is a little bit more, uh, you know, all the cars are, are very close, if not the same. They're all the same engine, which the name is escaping me, even though I just talked with uh, my buddy Bozy about it last week. So uh, LMP2, George, I will let you take it away from there. Yeah, and it's uh, Gibson. Gibson's the uh, spec engine for all the P2 entries. And the reason we kind of throw in Colin Brown there is, again, he's been speculated for a couple seasons. He's done some, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he actually did a test about a year or two ago. Could be wrong there. But his name was has been whispered quite a bit this offseason, kind of filling in the gaps in Dragon Speed's IndyCar schedule, where they've got a couple confirmed races, I think six at the moment. But they might expand beyond that and might throw in Colin on some ovals because he's got a lot of oval experience. But that's uh, just speculation there slash some rumors. Uh, in terms of the P2 field, field size is uh, up from last year. We only had two full season entries last year, and uh, off the top of my head, I think we had four in the Rolex, 
So six is a healthy addition with a lot of those rumored to either continue on through the full season or at least do all the endurance races. This year we do have a new rule where there's a mandate for a bronze driver and we can skip the <laughs> the fun of driver rankings in sports cars. But uh, essentially bronze is a gentleman driver or somebody who's a, a more or less, in theory anyways, a true amateur. So last year and years prior, you kind of had quote unquote amateurs that weren't really amateurs. So this is kind of forcing that class to kind of be more cost effective and gentleman driver E, if that makes any sense. And worth noting, there's no teams competing in P2 this year, i.e. there's no team with more than one car. Obviously, there's teams running the cars, but uh, for example, ERA or, yeah, ERA, not Tower. ERA was supposed to be run with the aid of Dragon Speed, but they decided to go out on their own. So it's six cars, six teams, every man for himself. Yeah, very well said there. The uh, new ERA Motorsports team just hired Jeff Braun as an engineer or somebody, you know, some sort of important role. I, I forget what it is off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Yes. I See, I knew I was correct. And moving on, we will jump down to GTLM. So there are two new of the brand new Corvette CR, C8Rs. I knew I was going to mess that up. And the cars look beautiful. I don't know how I feel about the sound yet, but, you know, I, I guess, you know, maybe in person will will change my opinion. The two BMW M8s, those are the Ray Hall cars, one Ferrari, and then two uh, IMSA Porsche 911s, which... Uh, are very nice looking. I think those are that or the Corvettes are my favorite looking cars in the field. The only IndyCar Indy car connection here is Colton Herta running one of the Ray Hall cars. So with that, I will turn it back over to you for a little preview on the GTLM. Yeah, and you're going to change your mind on those vets because man, oh man, they sound gorgeous in person and they look something else to boot. When it comes to those uh, Porsches, they are a new car. Uh, the the 911 has been around forever, but it's a new iteration of that where they have seen some action over in Europe and WEC, but this is the first North American outing for them, at least in the heat of battle. Some general notes. I'm going to pull one out for my homie, for GTs. They've been around for a couple of years. This is the first year we're not graced with their presence, and the uh, Ganassi team, obviously, is not involved in IMSA this year because of that. Reese is back. They only did the Rolex last year, Reese being the Ferrari team, with a stud lineup of a bunch of uh, Ferrari factory guys. And worth noting on the Corvette side, you know, that's a very established team. We lost in terms of the driver lineup. Um, Jan Magnussen is no longer with that team. In his place, we have Jordan Taylor, the younger Taylor brother. And they also changed the endurance lineup by adding uh, Nikki Katzberg, who, if I can remember correctly, has mostly been associated with BMW throughout his career, but that could be incorrect. But first time he's with that car. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes for that program. And it's a, it's a well-run program, even with a new car. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely curious to see that car in person and, and listen to it. So I am glad I hope to be proven wrong, like you said. Uh, we'll drop down to the, I don't want to call it the lowest class, the last class, the GTD, GTD class. We have a ton of cars in this class, uh, Lamborghinis, uh, more Porsches, the Lexus, the Aston Martins, the Acura, another BMW M6, the Audi R8, a Mercedes, and another Ferrari, this one, the Ferrari 488. Uh, IndyCar connections, plus some open wheel connections, plus some NASCAR connections in this class. Aaron Tielitz, Townsend Bell, Jack, Hawks, Jack Hawksworth, Catherine Legg, Tatiana Calderon, uh, and then everybody's favorite, Kyle Busch, and definitely everybody's favorite, AJ Allmendinger. So uh, this one, IndyCar connection also would be the, if I'm not mistaken, the Acura NSX is the Michael Shank cars, correct? That is 100% correct. I will let you take it over from here. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, I will say it was uh, good seeing Kyle Busch engage uh, very, very well with the fans at Roar. Now, people have their different perceptions, and I'm in that camp of you know, his uh, his driving style or general attitude with the media. But uh, shout out to him for being really awesome with the fans and uh, being really engaged. Also worth noting that Hawksworks really liking uh, sharing the car with him. I said he's been uh, learning a lot, asking a lot of questions. So 
legitimately interested and interested in doing well. So that's that's pretty cool to hear. GTD is definitely the most diverse class. Uh, you listed all the different manufacturers. It's really what makes IMSA special. You know, so many different manufacturers, varied engines, varied makeups, and uh, typically they run fairly close together. But with that big of a class, especially at a 24-hour race, there's going to be chaos. There's going to be changes up in the order, especially with wave arounds in the middle of the night. Typically always rains, too, which makes things super spicy. Uh, Lamborghini's won the past two with GRT Grasser winning, I think, both of those. And this year they haven't necessarily expanded, but they have two quote-unquote associate entries that they're helping to run for a fee, that is. But uh, So I guess you can call them the biggest team of the lot. That being said, uh, the Lamborghinis were caught or accidentally ran the wrong gear stacking during Roar. So they lost all their, quote, qualifying times. Uh, we can touch on Roar qualifying a little bit here in a minute. And also worth noting in that class, it, it won't be an issue during the race, but Turner and Riley, the Riley being they're the only Mercedes in the field, were called to the principal's office for maybe trying to toy with the BOP a little bit during Roar. So nobody knows quite what they have, uh, but IMSA caught on a little bit to that. So yeah, that's worth noting. Yeah, I know, and I'm sure you'll probably mention this in a minute. They're trying to kind of crack down on on sandbagging a little bit more this year than in years past, which uh, I hope worked. But I guess we'll see. I was it was curious when I saw that they <laughs> like that got called to the principal's office. When I when I read that, I was expecting. I don't know, an article or something to pop up online. And I don't think we really saw anything. So that is the four class rundown of everything to expect from a entry standpoint. Now the favorite, what everybody's favorite topic in sports car racing, and I'm still trying to you know, wrap my head around it in, in greater detail. Actually, you and I will be talking at some point in the next, let's just say a couple of weeks with, I'm going to keep uh, with a surprise guest about the BOP. So balance of performance, Mr. Butts, what is it and why does everybody hate it so much? Well, it's uh, let's just say if you got a bunch of sports car drivers in a bar and team owners, this, that, and the other, uh, they had a few beverages and you brought up either BOP or driver ranking, definitely some sort of chaos would break out. So BOP, balance of performance, it's IMSA is not the only series that does it. Every series does it a little bit different. Some call it success ballast is what WEC is spinning it as now. But it's an effort to keep all the cars somewhat close together and the racing closer. Um, with so many varied manufacturers, like you touched on with your wonderful guest and the engine breakdown, it's, you, you can't just put them all on track as they naturally are without something running away with it. So this is the, the series efforts to really improve the ROI for the manufacturers and the ROI and enjoyment factor for the fans. So it's, uh, again, it's worth noting at Roar, they've, they've made a few adjustments since because while they do have data loggers in the cars that are pretty accurate now, yeah, there's still some chances of sandbagging. And when it comes to Turner and Riley, I happen to be in the right spot at the right time in the paddock where they pulled them off track and made him park right next to the IMSA official hauler. So it was kind of funny to see, but uh, uh, they're obviously cracking down on, well, I won't call it sandbagging. It might have been accidental. You never know. So in terms of BOP, there was literally an update today, and I'll give credit to um, Sports Car 365 for a nice little write-up on it. DPI, Acura got hit with a horsepower reduction. Uh, Caddy gets a weight, a weight break which is good because Cadillac got kind of killed at the end of season with, with BOP. And all the DPIs got a fuel capacity increase. P2, really worth noting Riley, or the Riley chassis run by Rick Ware. Talking with Rick and Mr. Riley a little bit at Roar, that particular car isn't great at a track like Daytona. So has actually made a specific for Daytona change where they're allowed to run the car without certain aero pieces, be it wickers or dive planes. So hopefully that increases the straight line speed and makes it a little bit more competitive. Uh, GTLM, just running through these really quickly. That had some nice increases in horsepower and fuel. Ferrari got a HP reduction and a fuel decrease. Uh, Porsche got a little bit extra weight, but got some fuel capacity for that. 
And when I say horsepower reduction, what they do is they do certain sizes of air restrictors. So the engine's not getting quite as much horsepower or certain boost allocations for certain RPM ranges. So super technical. I won't even pretend to know everything about it. But moving along, GTD, Acura got hit the hardest, which is unfortunate because they're having a really good roar. And Shank was talking about how excited he was for the Rolex. But they got hit with a horsepower reduction, fuel capacity reduction, and a weight increase. Audi was kind of the only quote-unquote winner in the sweepstakes for that class with a, uh, a pretty nice weight break. So moving along, quickly do want to plug the support series race for the weekend. The Michelin Pilot Challenge, BMW Endurance Challenge, uh, the technical name for the event. Uh, Four-hour race, 49 cars split into two classes. 31 Grand Sport, which are essentially GT4 cars, then a record 18 TCR touring car entries. It's a great event, well worth the time to watch it, especially if you're having a slow day at the office on Friday. Either tune in or uh, catch it on radio. It's always uh, a lot of good action. And number of notable people, uh, Brian Herter runs a three-car team that has Gabby Chavez and Ryan Norman in it this year, and the very aptly numbered number 33. Hyundai uh, Veloster in. Worth noting as well, Ford is continuing to put some of their NASCAR young guns in their Mustang in the series. Of note, Austin Sendrick, Chase Briscoe, and the uh, quite nice, had a brilliant conversation with her at Roar, Haley Deegan. So new up-and-comer there in NASCAR. Uh, she's looking to make some waves and do some big things. And of course, everybody's fan favorite, person I owe charity money to, and Dinner with Racer star Ryan Eversley in a new team in a Honda TCR this year. Honda, of course, he's a Honda factory guy. So Yeah, Ryan's a super cool dude uh, from the few interactions I've had with him. So we will uh, we'll make some picks, and then we will, as we typically do in an episode, guess on who might struggle to wrap this episode up. Now, since there's four classes, this might take a couple minutes longer than it normally does in an episode. I will make my pick first in, in the DPI, and then I will let you pick first the next class, and we'll alternate back and forth here. So DPI, I am going to predict that the Scott Dixon Wayne Taylor Racing number 10 car is going to be the winner there. George, I will Interesting let you... choice. Yeah, I'm I'm just going with, uh, you know, listen, Scott Dixon and, and Ryan Briscoe, our, our two stud drivers, Kamui Kobayashi, I think he won, was it last year or the year before? When, last year with Alonzo. Yep, yep, with Alonzo. Okay, I knew I wasn't making that up. So he's won before. So they've, they've got a strong stable of drivers. And I think that BOP increase will really help them there. So I will let you go next. Yeah, so I'm going to go on a different, uh, have a different take here. I think it's going to be one of the Mazdas, and of the two, I think the 77's a little bit uh, uh, better looking in terms of a driver lineup. They've been quick all roar. They set that new record lap, and last year they finally found their footing as a as a team uh, with a couple of race wins. It was a, a long-standing eh, kind of a bad joke in sports car fandom that the Mazdas always caught on fire and they're they're always running well until they weren't. Well, they finally broke through last year, so I think they finally have proven the platform and have that reliability um they've got a really good lineup that's very familiar with that car and uh that's that's why it's my pick yeah great choice there and i'm pretty sure i made that same mazda joke when i talked to uh, bozy about the imsa engines last week so my bad uh moving down to <laughs> lmp2 my winner pick here i'm gonna go with the new team era motorsport simply because i like the name and I don't know much about any of their drivers, to be completely honest with you, but that's that's my pick. All right. Well, this will be teasing a little bit of our of one of our next segments. It's uh, they're actually my dark horse uh, for the race. Jeff Brown is a uh, man. He's a brilliant strategist. Having him on the timing stands huge. And frankly, I just love Ryan Lewis, and they've got a great supporting cast in that car. So I think they'll do uh, do pretty well, but they are a new team, so that's why I have them as a dark horse. A little bit more obvious pick could be Dragon Speed. They're the defending race winners. They got uh, well, they got Jeff's son Colin in the car, and they got Adrian Newey's uh, son, who's been doing 
some pretty decent things over in Europe and now in Asia the past couple of years. Also would say PR1 Mathiason has a good chance. Uh, they're one of only two cars that ran the full season last year and won it. And they've got a very experienced lineup. I like it. All right, we're going to move down to GTLM. I really struggled kind of picking who I my my winner prediction here. So I am going to go with, I think last year, Herda, Herda's our uh, Ray Hall team won. Yes. So I am going to pick something different this year. I'm going to go with the number three Corvette with Jordan Taylor, Antonio Garcia, and the aforementioned Nikki Katzberg. I think the Corvette's going to surprise some people with its competitiveness, and uh, everybody should be looking out for it. Yeah, it's a pretty good choice. And uh, Dan Binks runs one heck of a program, and you know those guys have tested, so hopefully the reliability is there. But I'm going to go with, frankly, either of the Porsches. Bam Thor, the uh, eh, nom de plume, or uh, nom de grere, rather, of Earl Bamber, and man, I am so bad at uh, <laughs> certain pronunciations. Uh, Lawrence Van Thor. Yeah, the, I'm not great with my Belgian, unfortunately. I don't think they speak French, and I'm not good with that either. So, But uh, those Porsches, man, they look good. They're quick. It's a, a well-oiled German machine, and man, I, I think they're just going to, I think they're going to clean up, but that class is always very competitive, so it's Frankly, it's crap shoot. Yeah, the the last two classes, I think, you know, with the slightly larger fields in terms of entries and differentiation in the cars is is definitely the toughest two to pick, in my completely not super educated opinion. So we'll move down to GTD. I've looked at the, the entry list legitimately for the last 45 minutes off and on during well, this recording and, and before really don't know who is going to win here so i'm just going to take a stab in the dark and give it to the number 12 aim vassar sullivan car with townsend bell and aaron tealitz and frankie monte calvo and then shane van gisbergen i don't know who either of them are but uh, personally but <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure they are capable drivers and i know townsend i think that car was in route to a real good finish either last year or the year before and then just you know got caught up in some bad luck so the number 12 lexus is my pick in the gtd yeah so i struggled with that class as well before the the, the new bop came out literally today and kind of pegged back the acura uh the 57 acura of shank was my clear pick but the 12 aim Vassar sullivan was pretty close Townsend Bell and Monte Calvo shared the car full time last year. Shane Van Gisbergen, the Gisberger, as he's uh, jokingly called. A lot of experience, especially down under. Total stud in uh, supercars and around uh, Mount Panorama. And, you know, Tealitz has done pretty well as an enduro driver for them. So I think they're a very, very good lineup. And, uh, you know, having a teammate, uh, granted, Shank does as well, helps quite a bit when it comes to strategery. But the 57 Acura, quick in practice, uh, a more experienced, longer together lineup than the 86, or did I say 56? 57 Acura, rather. 86 is the other car, indeed. But uh, out, of, out of those two cars, I think I'm still leaning towards the Acura. Talking with Shank, he had a really good feeling about things. And man, they got a great lineup, as do pretty much every team on this list. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, I think this this list, if you just look at the names, you know, going down the GTD list, uh, some of you guys might be familiar with these, some of these names, some might not. You know, I'm just going down, obviously, Townsend Bell and Aaron Tielitz, and Jax Hawksworth, Kyle Busch. Let's keep going down here. Catherine Legg, Christina Nielsen's a pretty accomplished sports car driver, Tatiana Calderon, Andy Lally, Spencer Pompelli. Uh, let's see here. I'm scrolling down to look through the list. Trenton Estep, who I believe did either did USF 2000 for a year or was in the Road to Indy shootout about two or three years ago. Let's go down. Ben Keating, who's racing in like 17 cars next weekend. <laughs> uh, real quick, Ben Keating is racing in GTD and what, LMP2? P 2 and uh, I'm pretty sure he's running Friday in the Pilot Challenge race as well. Yeah, so... Ben Keating is just going to be racing all weekend. I guess that's kind of every racer's dream in in a way, although that's 28 hours of, you know, obviously not consecutive racing, but that's that's a lot of racing. 
Anyway, so in terms of Dark Horse, I'm going to turn this segment over to you as our sports car expert as I continue to get myself up to speed here. Yeah, and since we're touching on GTD right there, I'll, I'll go reverse order up the uh, the class list. And it is worth noting that uh, for any sports car fan that's been around a while, uh, you'll see a lot of names you recognize, especially in GTD, because you I don't think you're required to. Actually, you might be for the 24. You're not for the 12, but pretty much every entry runs for drivers. So you have a lot of either factory guys or guys that have been around forever that, you know, know how to wheel a car. But in terms of uh, GTD, Dark Horses, I can't say no to Magnus. They're with uh, GRT this year, still in the same Lamborghini. But that team knows how to uh, uh, do strategy, especially if the yellows fall the right way, especially fuel strategy, at Daytona. A lot of familiar faces in that car. Uh, plus a Lambo factory driver, and uh, man, they they've been really lucky and skilled at Daytona in the past, and unlucky the one time they you know hit the possum in the middle of the night, which was kind of funny because Andy Lally was driving and he's a vegan. So uh, that's my pick for GTD Magnus Rules. Uh, it's sad this year that John Heckman's not running their media, but uh, so far their their media stuff has been pretty good regardless. So shout out to those boys. Uh, GTLM, it's it's man. I don't want to say any of these guys are dark horses. If I had to pick one, it'd be the vets just because it's unproven during a race. But word on the street is they've done a ton of testing. And like I mentioned earlier, there's been some changes to the driver lineup. So some new blood in there, but Dan Binks runs a tight ship. So I think we'll see them run pretty well. I'm moving farther up the order. P2 tower. It would be a uh, tower slash. Uh, I think they're power by star works, but uh, Tower Starworks, let's just call them that. Starworks is back in prototypes. Woo! They did GTD last year, but they've been known in the prototype ranks forever. Uh, Razzle Dazzle is kind of the lead driver of that operation. A lot of success, a lot of experience in that lineup. I think we'll see them do pretty well. And at the top step, number five, Mustang Sampling, JDC Miller Cadillac. That's what Bourdais is running in. And you also have Logue Duval sharing that car with with Bourdais and uh, uh, Barbosa, So, ton of sports car experience in there. The only three-man lineup in uh, DPI, which means if you know, they don't get uh, a lot of problems with yellows, they'll be able to establish more of a rhythm than some of the other uh, teams and entrants. So, I, I think keep an eye out on those guys. I like it. For any of those who are big sports car fans, give us your – dark horses and picks and in and who you think might struggle on social media uh, throughout the week leading up to the Rolex in terms of as I just mentioned who's going to struggle I will turn it over to you on this one but I am going to chime in here and there but I'll uh, just for uh, GTLM so start wherever you'd like and, and let's run down who your predictions for struggling are yeah you got it well, in uh, DPI, it's man, it's a like I like I mentioned earlier, qualifying was super close, quote unquote qualifying. Noteworthy, it's just for for spots for pits and in the garage area, but that that helps with strategy during the race. Uh, it's a long race after all. But uh, one second between all the entries, but there's one entry in that list that stands out, and that is the number 85 JDC Miller Cadillac, the the team card of the five. Tristan Vautier, one heck of a driver, is kind of leading that group. But that car is the only one in DPI with a silver driver, and they happen to have two of them. That's not knocking anyone's talent and, again, not getting into to driver ratings. But every other car in that grid has what's been determined by the FIA as fully professional drivers. Uh, you also have Matthias Leist, who's he's got some experience, obviously, in IndyCar and with the road to Indy. But he's brand new to the platform, and he had some struggles during the roar. And uh, Chris Miller and Juan Pedrohedra, they've had some seat time in there, but it's been fairly limited. So given how stout that lineup is, I think they're going to struggle the most on you know, pure race pace. Uh, they might get lucky with some uh, strategy and get lucky with, uh, with other people's misfortune. But uh, that'd be my pick for the quote-unquote struggle bus. P2. It's got to be Rick Ware. I hate it because I like Rick Ware. Talk talked to him quite a bit during Roar. It's, it's significant that EMSA is willing to go out of their way to let them take aero pieces off the car because it's that significantly slower than the rest of the cars in the class. And with the team shakeup, 
they haven't even announced formally the new drivers. I think Menno Rojas was mentioned as one of them, but you don't have any driver rapport. It's a relatively new team, and they run a completely different chassis in the Asian Le Mans series. So I, I think they're going to struggle. GTLM, I think I've picked them for literally everything. Corvette, new platform, new problem. You never know what's going to happen in terms of reliability once you're beating the crap out of a car for 24 hours. GTD, unless you wanted to step in there on your GTLM pick. You know, I'm just sad that you picked Corvette after I picked them to win. That's all I that's all I picked them for everything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, I was gonna give you the boo button, but I will uh I will not do that on, on your sports car here uh, episode here since you helped me out with the uh, roar coverage. So I will let you continue and, and I will give you a reprieve on that one. All right. Well, with GTD, uh, it's always hard to pick. Somebody like I think it was two years ago, uh literally crashed on the uh warm up lap before you even went green. So Strange things happen in that class, so you never know what's going to happen if you got a total amateur, a literal driving amateur starting the car. But, uh, man, Aston Martin, it's great having them back. They've been gone for a few years in IMSA. The number 23, Harder Racing, they've been a known quantity, but it's been four years since that program's existed. Uh, they ran something different, and that specific iteration of the program literally started three months ago for E.M. James, who's kind of heading that program for the team. And the more factory number 98 AMR entry, they had uh, Dalalana get knocked out with a skiing injury, and he was the guy kind of funding that program. They packed up on team orders during Roar on Saturday, and they unpacked half an hour later. A little bit of chaos there, lack of track time, and the uncertainty as to who the fourth driver is going to be doesn't really inspire that much confidence in that program or in their result for the 24 hours. So those are my picks for the struggle bus. I'm sure I'll be proven wrong on pretty much everything I've said tonight. But with that, what was your, uh, your comment on uh, GTLM? Uh, just the, just the Corvette piece there. I will, I'll, I'll say, I'll save you that one, but <laughs> I, I, I do, do wonder, you know, okay. I will say this. You do bring up a good point, new platform, new problems, that is that is definitely fair, but considering the Corvette, it's proven technology for the most part. I'm gonna I'm gonna say you're gonna be proven wrong there. I will say that, but I'll just leave it at that. I'd like to be proven wrong because man, I like that program. I like the guys in it. We're family friends with somebody who's been affiliated with the program as kind of a GM consultant. But moving from the rear engine to the mid engine platform going to be uh interesting to see what happens that is a good point I, I did kind of forget about that but man that is a nice looking car so we will wrap things up here with where to view where to listen and kind of how to follow along on some good social media accounts uh, nbc and nbcsn have 16 and a half hours of the race and i think the rest of the race you can catch on streaming if i'm not correct online the IMSA app has streaming or the IMSA.com website. A racer will have plenty of coverage as well. Sportscar365.com has coverage. And I'm pretty sure they have some TV and radio coverage, if I'm not mistaken. Or at least they'll tell you when the TV and radio coverage is changing. Obviously, you can follow along with Jess and I. We may do some sort of Instagram Live or Facebook Live at some point ridiculous hour of the night see what we're uh what we're thinking at four o'clock in the morning you'll <laughs> fueled on course of brew coffee course of brew.com and then also you know if you're curious spotterguide.com andy blackmore has a full list of all the liveries for all 39 or 40 entries so you know good to check that out as well and then social accounts i will go through two of these and then george i'll i'll go to the last part here for you and then anything else you want to cover before we wrap it up uh, obviously follow along with us at pit lane parlay p-a-r-l-e-y instagram twitter uh, the facebook group pit lane parlay fans will probably be active everywhere on social media jess and i haven't quite figured out what we're going to do but i'm sure we'll do something you know like i just mentioned some sort of live streaming chat with whoever wants to uh, talk maybe we'll do a few maybe i'll do one walking through the garage area in the middle of the night. We'll have some fun with it. Obviously, uh, at IMSA and Motorsports on NBC, we'll have plenty of updates, 
Sports Car 365 is a fantastic resource for everything sports car, you know, not just Rolex Weekend, but in general. And George, I will turn it over to you for the last few bits there. Yeah, and I do have to make a quick correction because Corvette fans are very passionate. They, they haven't been running a rear engine, obviously. Uh, Corvette runs a front engine until this new iteration, which is mid-engine. So they've gone to from front to mid. So I wanted to make that correction because I know I'll hear about it. In terms of uh, other social media accounts, obviously, if you have a favorite driver team, follow them. Some of the teams are really great about posting coverage from the pit wall or sometimes some in-car stuff. i got to since again, I owe him charity money and he's a great follow. Uh, follow Ryan Eversley. He will be around the paddock in the weekend and usually has some pretty good commentary on things. And obviously, you got to follow Pit Lane Parley. Oh, thank you, George. You're making me blush. So yeah, that that is our Rolex 24 preview. George, thanks very much for joining me. I hope everybody tunes in. Follow along on social media. Jess and I will be at the track Friday morning until race ends and try to get some you know cool photos and videos for you guys so uh with that we'll wrap things up george again thank you very much for joining and guys enjoy the race 